So it's 12 o'clock um, in Europe. It's um, 3.30 in India. So welcome. Um, I'm very happy to host this uh, first webinar on, uh, on the Sustainable Chemistry Club or today's webinar of the Sustainable Chemistry Club. My name is uh, Alexis Batsanella. I'm uh, the uh, director of the Innovation Hub of IC3, the International Sustainable Chemistry Collaborative Center. And I'm going to be the moderator for today. So uh, briefly about the Sustainable Chemistry Club, if you have not uh, visited one of our previous uh, sessions. So the Sustainable Chemistry Club was initiated last year. It's a collaboration between ISC3 and the Science and Technology Park Pune. So Vikram is also here in the room. Hello. Um, yeah, so this has been um, starting last year. And for this year, we have actually teamed up with the UNEP, so the UN Environment Programme, um, to have a closer look on um, the UNEP's uh, 10 objectives and guiding considerations for green and sustainable chemistry. And uh, so this is the first webinar where we specifically look at um, specific objectives. And I'm now going to share um, two slides with you for an, introdu for an introduction. So first of all, um, so today we are looking at uh, um, objectives six and eight. Six is on minimizing chemical releases and pollution. And objective eight is maximizing uh, social benefits. So that's the topic for today. Um, a bit of housekeeping rules. So as I said, the uh, webinar is in progress to be recorded. Um, please stay on mute unless uh, I would ask you to speak and to engage in a conversation. Um, you can uh, type in questions into, uh, I think we don't have a question box, we have a chat box. Um, and, and I will also take the question. That's in particular true for the panel discussion later. And uh, if you put something in the chat, please put in there your name and um, yeah, why you are here and uh, then place your question. That would be helpful. Okay. A brief look at the program. So we are still at the welcome and brief introduction. And uh, then uh, Colin Hanahan from uh, UNEP will introduce us a bit more specific into the objectives six and eight that I already mentioned. And then we have two startups or st founders of startups, uh, Sean Lavani and Karan Rostogi, uh, founders of uh, Coco Gusto and Help Us Green respectively. And uh, well, they will showcase uh, their startups. So typical pitch. And uh, then we will follow a panel discussion um, of around 30 minutes, where I also invite you as participants to, yeah, to ask questions, of course, and I will take them. And uh, then we end with the conclusions, um, some uh, for, for, um, forecast of uh, future events and closing remarks. So with this, I will stop sharing. Um, once again, ask you to please mute your mics because I already heard some background noises and uh, would like to come to our first, um, our first contribution. And I'd like you to introduce to uh, Colin Anahan. Colin is with UNEP. He joined UNEP as a consultant. In, no, because if you are going to have 15 or 20... Uh... Nitesh, could you please? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he joined UNEP as a consultant in January 2021, focused on green and systemic chemistry and the science policy interface for chemicals and waste. Uh, prior to joining uh, UNEP, Colin studied uh, systemic chemistry in Spain with a master's degree and he worked in research and development for green energy technologies in the private sector and academia. So Colin, happy to have you and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks Alexis for the introduction. Good morning to everybody. Well, good morning from 
the United States. I'm just going to share my screen here. Um, it's disappearing now. Is everybody seeing that? I think you're muted, Alexis. Yes. Good. Sorry, I said, uh, but it's but it's presenters mode. Oh, let me just swap that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Better. Okay. Great. So thanks again for the introduction, Alexis. My name is Colin. I um. I'm a consultant for the UN Environment Program. I focus on green and sustainable chemistry. And today I will be presenting UNEP's 10 objectives and guiding considerations for green and sustainable chemistry with a focus on objectives six and eight. But first, for those who maybe weren't able to attend the kickoff webinar, I'll just give a bit of context on the topic of green and sustainable chemistry and the United Nations work on it. So in 2019, UNEP released the second Global Chemicals Outlook. It is a comprehensive review of the global chemical landscape, and there are a few key messages that synthesized all this information. One is that there is a rapidly growing chemical market, and hazardous chemicals and other pollutants continue to be released and are ubiquitous in humans and the environment. And this growth, while resulting in some concerning trends also presents an opportunity for green and sustainable chemistry innovation. So green and sustainable chemistry innovation has potential for circularity, for climate change with energy storage technology, or for pollution but through the design of biodegradable materials. So in 2019, at the fourth United Nations Environment Assembly, which is essentially the world's parliament on the environment, this potential was recognized by member states through the adoption of Resolution 4 slash 8, which welcomed an analysis of the best practices in sustainable chemistry and requested the, unit, the United Nations Environment Program to synthesize manuals on green and sustainable chemistry. So the first of these manuals, it's available now on our website, along with an executive summary, is called the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Framework Manual. And it provides a high level overview of scientific, technical, and policy aspects of green and sustainable chemistry. It has chapters two, three, and four. Those answer the why is green and sustainable chemistry needed and what does it aim to achieve with chapters five, six, and seven, focusing on enabling measures such as policies, innovation ecosystems, and, and making that enabling environment to achieve what it wants to achieve. So then more recently at the fifth, second session of the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly, another resolution was passed recognizing this manual and encouraging its use as appropriate. So now this is a key focus of our work. It's, it's turning the recommendations from the framework manual into action, supporting all stakeholders, maybe some of you in the audience, the companies that we'll hear from later to take action. So central to using the framework manual and a foundational aspect in general are the 10 objectives and guiding considerations from chapter three. So they are the result of a long consultative building process with many experts with, with experience related to green and sustainable chemistry. And they include green chemistry aspects, such as non-toxic molecular design, but also sustainability aspects to encourage chemistry innovations to address the environmental and social challenges of our time. So ultimately, the goal of these objectives is to unveil the full potential of chemistry such that it is compatible with and supports the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And while these objectives are meant to be viewed as one, you know, we don't want to advance one objective at the expense of the other. I think this is a good opportunity to, to get a little bit deeper into the objectives. So I'm going to explain objective six a little bit. That's minimizing chemical releases and pollution. 
It encourages stakeholders to implement or enable actions that minimize the release of chemicals throughout the life cycle of products. This includes manufacturing, it includes use, it includes disposal. And for this reason, communication with suppliers up and down the value chain is really key for achieving this objective. And you can see here at the bottom some ways to advance this objective by creating new designs that minimize or eliminate hazardous chemicals and products. So we'll hear from Coco Custo later. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil her presentation, but we'll see that Coco Custo is doing things to advance objective six by creating new designs. Another way is by ensuring reuse and recycle of materials. And we'll hear from Help Us Green how they are doing that to prevent the release of chemicals into waterways. And then not necessarily from the entrepreneurial side, other stakeholders, they can help to foster an enabling of our environment around objective six by improving information transparency about what chemicals are in products or by promoting the use of pollutant release and transfer registry systems to identify where key hotspots around a country or a region, the chemicals are being released through pollutants. So as I mentioned before, green and sustainable chemistry, it includes the sustainability aspect, including social sustainability. And that's where objective eight comes in. And it aims to ensure activities related to chemical innovation and management are compatible with or advance social sustainability objectives. So this includes chemistry relevant action that protect workers and disadvantaged communities and ensuring that everyone can enjoy the benefits of sustainable chemistry. So, don't want to spoil what Karen has to say from Help Us Green, but we identified his company as, as doing good work to advance objective eight. And then Coco Custo, they're trying to make green and sustainable chemical products accessible to everybody. That's a key part of their mission. And this objective also includes enabling entrepreneurs and small and medium sized enterprises in all countries, including developing and emerging economies through financial and technical support to develop and scale up sustainable chemistry innovations. So this, this helping entrepreneurs in developing countries is a great entry point for policymakers and financial actors and larger companies to, to contribute. So zooming out from the objective six and eight, as I said, we want to look at these objectives as one in the end and achieving a transformation in the green and sustainable chemistry will require advancing all of them. So this will require scaling up of companies with similar visions as Coco Custo and Help Us Green, as well as the introduction of new companies and action from outside stakeholders to enable such scaling up, which is described in chapters four and five of the framework manual. So UNEP hopes that the objectives can act as a tool to guide companies to make impactful actions via the operation of their business or for other stakeholders to take action as well, which is impactful. So while we're developing that farther and what that's going to look like, a good starting point could be an initial assessment of sustainability performance that considers the objectives. What actions am I taking as a company, as a, as a government, as an NGO, as a citizen? To advance the objectives, what more can I do? How am I working with the supply chain? So while it's a little bit esoteric at the moment, UNEP is working to make them more of a concrete tool. And a key aspect of doing this is the gathering of illustrative examples, case studies, and best practices for people who are advancing them. So these events are a great way of doing that. But I would encourage anybody in the audience to circulate the objectives and, and, and reach out to me. You'll see my email on the next screen with examples which they are involved with or familiar with for those who are advancing the objectives as well. We'd love to hear from you. And that's all for my presentation today. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from the next presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Perfect introduction also to our two startups and uh, well, apologies again for it. It's really early for you so in the US, so <laughs> no worries. Glad that you are able to make it. Uh, very good. So we continue in the program and we start with um, a showcasing of our first startup. And I would like to introduce you to Sean Lavani. Um, she is a founder of Coco Gusto. 
And in her own words, um, she is, uh, or she describes herself as an environmentalist, scientist, and explorer. Um, as, an mechanical, as a mechanical engineer by training, she has worked in the real estate and construction industry for 10 years before starting Coco Gusto. And as you say, Coco Gusto was created with the vision that any industry could be re uh, revolutionized to be sustainable. And um, as uh, Sean found out what the ingredients in cleaning products were and how they affected our bodies and environments, she realized she had no other choice but to create an alternative and to create a business. So we're very curious, uh, Sean, to, to learn and, um, about your startup. And uh, so looking forward to your presentation. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Um, dive right into it. So there I was, 25 meters under the sea, surrounded by beautiful coral and brightly colored tropical fish, and I was completely horrified. Um, earlier that day, my dive instructors had been talking about how cleaning chemical runoff from all the resorts had started to bleach the coral in the shallower bays. Turns out cleaning chemical pollution poses a considerable threat to um, aquatic ecosystem from posing a threat to coral reefs, um, causing eutrophication events in um, freshwater bodies because of their phosphate content, or just because the sheer quantity of it that is used in our daily lives. Um, that's when I realized there was a gap in the market for a sustainable cleaning product um, that work just as well or better than a commercially available alternative. And it was price competitive as well. Um, so wash for wash, Coco Custo costs exactly the same as its commercially available alternative. And thus people can make the switch without any financial, uh, additional financial burden, which is usually the case with a sustainable product. Um, we made a detergent from certified organic oils. So we've uh, managed to reduce the fertilizer and um, pesticide pollution at the beginning of the life cycle. And um, after that, all our ingredients are completely biodegradable, both aerobically and anaerobically. Um, they have a very short half-life and they pose absolutely no threat, so very low. I mean, the EC50 and the LCs and the, you know, the lethal doses and lethal concentrations required to cause any effect are very high. And um, they also pose absolutely no threat to human health, fertility, or, and contain no known carcinogens. Also, we package our products plastic-free, thus reducing plastic pollution as well. Um, Turns out making a sustainable product isn't just good for the environment, but it's a great marketing decision. People love sustainable products. A recent study found uh, worldwide, 75% of millennials will pay a premium for a sustainable product. In India, that number is closer to 57%, but 90% of the respondents um, Survey did place sustainability as one of their key decision makers when buying a product. And besides the fact that we're a rapidly growing company, what's great is um, we're kind of part of a community and 30% of our sales are repeat customers. Um, hi, I'm Sean. I'm actually not a chemist. I've studied mechanical engineering and I've spent most of my life on construction sites. Oftentimes I was the only woman on the site um, or in a room. In fact, I have been asked by a client to not speak and only take notes. I have been called things like a glorified secretary. And for me, um, you know, in my graduating class of 47 engineers, I was only one of the six women in that class. So for me, um, gender equality is extremely important. And so we believe in um, creating sustainability in that sense also. Um, 
you know people say that sustain you know people talk about sustainability only in the ecological sense but sustainability is the ability of a system to endure so we also look at sustainability in the social and finance and obviously economic sense uh, what we try and do is we hire women, um, mostly students from um, economically weak perceptions of society who are studying science and chemistry and pharmacy as well as business. And we, um, we try and upskill them and help them um, learn some leadership skills. And because they're from economically weaker sections of society, they may not have the internship opportunities that most people from other sectors of society have and we try and make it inclusive for the women as well um what's great about running a sustainable business is that it um it doesn't feel like a competition it feels like you're part of a community uh what happens is that other businesses rally around you there are organizations like the isc3 that will support you there's there's a lot of support and it's and it really is like being part of a community um and i hope like me you can be inspired by nature to create a sustainable business and maybe make sustain uh, chemistry a little more sustainable and uh, this is just a picture of a shark i like to finish off thank you Thank you, Sean. Uh, very impressive uh, to learn that you really have a very holistic view on what you do. And uh, obviously, you're not just uh, focusing on environmental issues, but uh, have a, a clear uh, social uh, dimension as well with your business. So uh, very good in this uh, presentation on uh, objective six and eight of uh, the UNEP uh, um, objectives. So. Thank you for this. And um, if you have questions uh, for Sean, we don't uh, discuss that now, but of course you're invited uh, to, to place questions and we uh, can take them uh, during the panel discussion. Um, so we continue with uh, the second speaker, Karan, or the third speaker in the sense, second startup speaker, Karan Rastogi. He's the founder of the award-winning social enterprise Help Us Green, as already been mentioned. Um, that preserves river Ganges from becoming a religious sewer by flower cycling the waste from temples and mosques dumped in the river into patented life lifestyle products, providing livelihood to 49 rural families in Kanpur, which is uh, the northern Indian state uh, uh, in the northern Indian state uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, Karan um, received his bachelor degree in statistics from University of Delhi and a master in business analytics and consulting from Warwick Uni uh, Business School in the UK. And uh, already as an undergraduate, he has worked on multiple projects to spread the carbon credit awareness in the UK, Italy and India, and was actively promoting impact entrepreneurship in Northern India. And um, Karen, you say you have a passion for business design that makes a different uh, direct impact on people's lives. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karun Rastogi, and I'm the founder of Help Us Green. The journey started about 10 years ago in 2012, after completing my master's from Warwick Business School. I returned to my hometown to pursue my father's business of footwear, trading and manufacturing. It is a ritual in most of the families in India where they visit a nearby place of worship. Similarly, my father had been visiting a Kanpur's most sacred temple over 30 years. One fine day, owing to his bad health, I asked him to let me continue that tradition. In India, people bring flowers on a daily basis. Gifts for gods, blessings for life, for celebrations and rituals. To, to the tune that 8 million metric tons per year. These flowers are thrown, thrown into the rivers with a belief that their prayers have been offered dumping the toxins like arsenic, lead, and cadmium used in the pesticides along with the flowers. This polluting the river, causing an in enormous waterborne disease. What struck my mind was I cannot change the way people worship, and I can certainly not ask them to alter their faith. But what I could do was to change the way we look at the waste. Oxford Dictionary describes waste as the materials that are no longer needed and are thrown away. But for me, that was a resource. So we created a company with a vision to make religion sustainable 
and a model of the circular economy that would help build a sustainable world. Daily flowers are collected from temples and other places of worship and then separated by women who then dry them and transform them into incense sticks, colors and other products. Women usually hail from a marginalized community, excluded from the most opportunities to change their lives. A bus driver drives them to and fro from work where they are given tea twice a day, clean drinking water, OFD toilets, a steady job. For us, the basic necessities of life are food, clothing and shelter. And nowadays it's internet. But for them, it is self-respect. What they told me that how differently they feel as people to be respected. They love coming to one place rather than moving from house to house. They are they were very humble about the learning skills and admitting that it took them longer than the others. But now they love that they have mastered the art of rolling incense and making colors. Even to that, the sticks in, in turn are used in the places of worship where at times they are denied the entry. Up till now, we have recycled over 3.7 million kilos of flour waste and have changed the lives of over 49 rural families. Due to this mission and vision to create a circular economy, we have gained interest of not only the Indian but also the international media. We were awarded by the United Nations in 2018 as the momentum of change by the fast company as world changing ideas, Forbes 30 under 30, to name a few. During the COVID year, we even trained the farmers of Uttarakhand and Karnataka the art of using waste as a new resource to ensure no flower goes waste. We tied up with Z Black, a premium incense manufacturer in India, so that they could distribute our products to the mass market because that is where the change begins. With the University of uh, Chhattisgarh, we are also developing a technology to extract oil from the dry flowers, a, a device as small as a washing machine, which can be used to sell essential oils and the refuse of that can be used to make incense sticks. In the end, I would like to say, if only we looked at the problems around us and saw them as incredible opportunities to make change and then considered how we do the work as important as we do. More of us would find the meaning and the purpose and sometimes that sometimes feels elusive to too many of us in the fast-paced world. More than that, in our, independent, in our interdependent world, we need more circular economy examples that integrate all the stakeholders rather than the shareholders into the way we do business. Thank you. Sorry, I had to find my mic, room, mic again. Uh, so uh, yeah, Karen, thank you. Um, again, great example. Um, so we had two great examples on, on the two objectives we're trying to tackle today. And um, yes, um, I think we would like to continue this in our panel discussion, um, where we would like to discuss and also perhaps learn more from our, from our startups here. Um, how to turn green and systemic chemistry innovation into a successful business. And uh, the question, are there any common obstacles, best practices and key actions, for example? Um, you have uh, already met uh, three of our panelists, that's Colin, Sean and Karan, of course. Um, but I also want to uh, introduce you to our fourth panelist, and that's uh, Dr. Pravat Arya. Um, he is a former distinguished research professor in chemistry and chemical biology at uh, Dr. Reddy's Institute of Life Science at the University of uh, Hyderabad. Um, he has spent more than 22 years as a senior research officer at the National Research Council of Canada. And uh, prior to this was also adjunct professor in biochemistry at McGill, Montreal, and in chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Ottawa. Um, Dr. Arya moved back to India in 2009 to establish a chemical biology research program. And he is himself a multiple founder of uh, companies, Sign Mode Pharmaceuticals, 
Smigen and uh, Stealth Mode Biotech, the latter in the making. Um, all, as I understood, in the area of synthetic biology, biotechnology, and let's say modern drug discovery with a more holistic view on the complexity of uh, physiological processes and uh, protein protein interactions, if I get that right. Um, so, welcome into our round. Uh, so, we have three very experienced founders um, in, in the panel. And um, of course, I would uh, like to address the first question. Um, but before that, um, again, to the audience, you are invited to ask questions and to participate in the discussion. So please uh, post your name and uh, question in the, uh, in, in the chat. Um, and then I can uh, call you to ask your question and unmute your mic. Um, yeah, first question to our founders in the panel. And um, so what can we actually do to advance uh, systemic chemistry idea towards a concrete business? I would like you to share your view and experiences with us. So are there any key factors and actions? Um, did you miss something in your own uh, on your own journey as, as a founder uh, or in the innovation ecosystem? That, that's the kind of things I'm, I'm looking for. Dr. Arya, would you like to start? Perhaps uh, everyone else has already talked quite a lot. Okay. Uh, first of all, well, <laughs> thank you very much, Alexis, and your team also for organizing this event. Uh, truly appreciate it. And, and we saw uh, two beautiful examples of one in the, you know, focusing on your objectives six and eight. And uh, thanks, Colin, also for sharing your 10 key objectives that you folks have come up over the years. I think they're really good. And, uh, and I'm pleased to note that the, our two, you know, startups are focusing on two of the directions or two of the objectives that, you know, that are sort of aligned with the, your main agenda of, you know, sustainability and, uh, and green chemistry. And uh, current case in, uh, in the recycling, very, very important. I think flour is one example. I think there could be many more applications. And in Sean's case, of course, using an organic oil, again, preventing the toxic materials, less waste products. Now, touching upon to how do we advance, I think I'm speaking as a chemist, you know, I have worked in the lab for more than 30 years. So I've seen enough of what chemistry can do. And my, my kind of appreciation for doing chemistry differently has grown tremendously over the last, let's say the last, you know, last decade or so, because the early days we were less talking about, you know, releasing waste into the system. And now we're becoming very careful. So my message to most of the chemists, because India is a large country and we have a huge, you know, the chemical industries, I think, it would be nice when we design our chemical methods, we should really look into the, the methods which uh, first of all produce, uh, use less uh, waste products, less solvents, no toxic material, and try to use more modern reaction where you can minimize the side toxic products and use catalytic organic reactions, you know? And, and that's a big push now uh, in terms of when we are doing the chemical synthesis, we make sure we do not end up you know, producing more waste than having one of the products and the several other products going into the, into the river or the mainstream of the society. I think the advancement of chemical knowledge is, is extremely going to be useful in, in coming decades or so for revising the revising the scope of all of our chemical uh, industries in India, point number one. Uh, point number two, which uh, I thought you know, was a beautiful, where Sean's example is using an organic oil, you know, not really using a kind of a chemical synthesis material. It's a, I guess this is a natural source of material. She's using it. It's the byproducts would be kind of also less toxic because this is purely a natural material and it's it's a beautiful application into the, you know, taking care of environment. A current example is very nice because that's really touching upon 
minimize waste and utilize the waste um, waste material and getting into more useful. And I, I think that's a beautiful application where the flowers, you know, every day India is a country of flowers we use every year. And it's a, if you can, if you can, you know, get your organic materials smartly without, you know, without getting into a lot of uh, chemical uh, side waste, I think this is an excellent way. A uh, same could go for many, many products. I think where chemistry in early days of 60s, 70s, 80s, I think was a contributing factor, but I think more and more we are realizing that if we use our modern science, modern knowledge, social consciousness, uh, perhaps I think we, we can make some useful contributions to the society. So that's what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Sean and Karan, would you, would you like to share a bit of your, let's say, experience? So was it uh, quite straightforward what you did or did, did you observe any obstacles actually? Uh, Uh, not straightforward. Thank you, Mr. Prabhat, for uh, the appreciation. And uh, I, must, I mean, when we started the journey, it was a very uh, difficult one because in India, if you talk about waste management, people are, were really unaware of it back in 2011. And the only solution anyone would have was composting. Mm -hmm. And composting doesn't solve the problem. You have to think beyond composting and develop products that can be used on everyday basis. And this is just one type of waste that we're dealing with. I'm really curious to know what other types of waste I can do. Suppose there is a large pickles industry in India, which have a huge amount of vegetable peels. There can be certain things that can be made from that. If, if, we, do our, uh, if we do our research correctly, then we can have good solutions towards these kind of waste and have a good uh, product around it. Mm -hmm. How about the families you were in, involving in, in your activities? Because I think that that's also a key, uh, well, key factor in, in your business. So um, did, yes. did you need to do some convincing there or was that? So easy? yeah, see, uh, I, have to, I had to convince my family because coming uh, from strictly from a management college and then doing something like waste management was some so was simply unacceptable to them and that to a family in north india where uh, they are mostly into the business kinds so it took it took me around three years to convince them that yes i'm on the right track i participated in about 40 competitions across the nation even in un even in singapore to make sure that my idea was correct and i'm on the right track be it nus be it uh, water and beat anywhere. So that also gave me the confidence that yes, if you believe in something and you have the patience to do it, mm. re the results will come. I guess, Sean, for you, it was also a big step from, let's say, the construction industry to what, what you do now with uh, Coco Gusto. So uh, um, yeah, can, yeah, can you share your experiences here? Yeah, it was it was definitely a big step, especially coming from a completely non uh, chemistry background. In fact, I was not very good at chemistry in school. And um, I think I think one of the, the great things is that knowledge is now sort of open source. Um, it's it's not held. I think I, I don't think I would have been able to do this even 20 years ago. Um, could you please mute your phone? So, uh, okay. okay. Sorry, God. So uh, I think I think what's great is that um, knowledge is a little more open source now. So you can, um, you know, if you have a little bit of training, you can go in and you can learn things and um, you can, you can get uh, journal articles and papers and access to patents and 
it's kind of a democratic process now compared to what it used to be before. Even when I was in college, it wasn't this easy to have access to information. And I think that is a key factor which will help people who have different backgrounds. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a different background kind of brings a different point of view because you come without the biases of the past. And I think if, if we allow people from all over, like Karan, who came from a management background, and me, who came from a construction background, if you allow, there's no gatekeeping, and you allow people from different backgrounds to come in and become part of um, this chemical chemistry movement, I think that that will be a great, that's a key factor in moving things forward. Okay. Colin, I think you have a direct remark to that, right? Yes, yeah, sorry to extend this question, but just great to have both of these startups in a room together. And I think both of them are especially visionary. So, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody, but I'm just curious if, you know, there was one thing, one factor, maybe it was a meeting or another organization or a tool or a road mapping activity, which, which was particularly useful in turning your vision into a business and moving it forward. If there's something that you can think of, it doesn't have to be big or, but I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it was, um, I started a little bit on, before I started the company, I was doing a couple of um, beach, organizing beach cleanups and was, I become a part of like a sustainable community. So when I started the business, I found incredible support and I, and I have found that sustainability is an incredibly supportive um, ecosystem. Everybody has the same goal and uh, everybody wants everybody else to succeed and uh, i think i think that's what allowed um coco Custo from being just a pipe dream to being an actual business that works have you been aware of the two ten uh, just for curiosity uh, for uh, on the 10 uh, unit objectives before so was that uh, something you were considering? Um, no, it was. They were new to me, but when I read them, they all okay. They all fell in line. It felt like you know I, that that's that's my mission, anyways. So right. It, they they felt very natural. Yeah, we found you regardless, right? Um, but uh, Colin, I think that's uh, something that that's of course also on the to do list in the end to to make make this uh, things common knowledge and. Um, I guess uh, so. Colin, would you would you see? Um, do you have a let's say? Do you have yourself a roadmap on how we can uh, uh, use the uh, unit objectives and guiding considerations as a tool to to guide entrepreneurs? So, is there any anything we can we should do? Yeah, I don't know if Karen wanted to say something first, or should I just? Oh, no, that's okay. No, I'm good, thanks. Okay. Yes, well, we are working to to make the objectives a more useful tool. And I think it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation where, you know, at the moment what we're doing is we're trying to find examples of of people who are who are advancing them and using those experiences to synthesize some more general recommendations for other companies or not just companies, but governments and NGOs and, and whoever. Um, but I don't think we can't assume that everybody has the same vision and, and commitment to sustainability and, and understanding that Sean and Karen both have yeah. to, to make their chemical innovations truly sustainable and, and looking for, for ways, you know, for example, Sean, mentioned the plastic packaging aspect for her products you know that doesn't really have anything to do with her with her detergent that's sustainable but it's looking for other ways to make it to make the company sustainable and the objectives can help identify those other ways and other areas to 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 impact sustainability and also hopefully improve your business in general 
Uh, it's actually the holistic view we always say that which which is important to to look at uh, at, at your uh, innovation and your product uh, over the whole uh, life cycle and and to 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 consider all the different bits and pieces that contribute to sustainability so i think this is a it's a beautiful example even if it's sort of a side topic for you uh, that that you also look into these things um, Karen, um, sorry if I interrupted you, but uh, you still wanted to respond to the question if you were aware of uh, the UNEP uh, objectives before? Uh, I had read them uh, when I was doing my thesis on the sustainable practices ah, okay. of 500 yeah. companies. Mm -hmm. But uh, more than that, I became aware when, uh, when you go to a place of worship for your peace of mind, right? Now imagine you going there and you found a heap of flowers with plastic bags and all sorts of materials in it and cow goats and dogs littering the entire place you can't expect a peace of mind down there right so that what motivated me to make sure that i could keep the temples clean and provide employment to the rural women and make products out of it mm -hmm. that was the main goal okay um Perhaps I have uh, two first uh, questions on the uh, in in the chat, um, and perhaps uh, Prabhat, perhaps that's something you could could answer. Um, could you comment on what is the penetration of green chemistry approaches in specialty chemical manufacturing in India? Do you do you have an answer to that? Uh, you're you're still on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I think to answer your question, uh, the the general awareness among the, the chemistry based companies in India has grown significantly in last, I would say, last a few years, and and more and more the the we are talking about this, what we were talking, let's say, ten years before, which is a a, a step in the right direction, and uh, so I think. I see the positive trends among the young entrepreneurs. The you know it's a, it's a challenge for also established companies. It's a slow process in in many of the systems when you have to revise the strategies. But definitely, you know, people are talking about flow chemistry, the green chemistry, the use of you know less waste products bringing modern reactions catalytic organic chemistry i think it is it is coming in on many fronts uh, we are going to see much more visible impact in let's say next five to ten years because this is an effort that is started but started very seriously i'm sure most uh, companies are cognizant and they are aware of it now depending upon how it fits into their business agenda you know because they have to make some uh, some decisions but it is we are in the right direction let's put it this way mm -hmm. um we, we have thank you very much for for that answer uh, we have uh, already started also about obstacles you you might have observed and there's also a, a related question uh, in the chat from irene adelmeyer from greetings to paris um so a question for Sean: Do you not suffer from the uh, concurrence or uh, competition of big cleaning industries and multinationals? Seventh generation and others in US mention that it is difficult to be competitive and sustainable. <laughs> Great question. It is very difficult to be competitive and sustainable, but um, let's talk about seventh generation. They were actually acquired by Unilever in uh, 2016. So the big multinationals, they are all going to go green, but I think um, they are doing this by acquiring smaller brands right now. So it's not so much competition um, as it is, okay, um, maybe how can you work together to make it uh, greener and bigger? Okay. Okay, um, I, I take, a, take another question. That's from Edwin. I don't see the whole name, sorry. 
so it, it's about the term green and sustainable chemistry. Um, how we how we would uh, see that? Is it about the chemistry of substances, product themselves, or uh, is it about sustainable management um, of, of chemicals? I think uh, for that, I, I might answer that at least from my view of uh, IC3, we would see it uh, as, a, as a very holistic approach. So we're talking about products, of course, also in all the different downstream sectors using chemicals, uh, but we're also talking about chemical production itself. Um, we would also include sourcing. We also would include the whole recycling, circularity, circular economy issues um, around that. So it's a very holistic view in the end. So um, chemicals management is of course included, but it's it's part of the whole um, the whole topic. That would be my, my view in it. I don't know, Colin, if you share that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, that's a proper explanation. It includes everything from the way you make chemicals, the way that you use chemicals in products, the way you dispose of them. And yeah, really emphasizing the entire life cycle and also enabling all of those things to happen, possibly through education, through events like this. That's a big part of, of making green and sustainable chemistry a reality. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would uh, like to continue with, uh, well, we're already heading towards the end of the panel discussion. So um, I have one important question. It is that's from your experience as founders. So what, which advice would you give to other chemistry startups creating a business with uh, regard to, to sustainability? If there is any uh, experience you would be able to share. Who wants to start? Is it a difficult question? <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Since that was a long time. Um, I think, uh, I think it's the uh, you know, a lot of people have an idea and then they get a little nervous about it. Um, and then you try and make your idea absolutely perfect before you send it out into the world. And I think it's okay if it's not so perfect. I think that would be my advice as a, when it comes to business and chemistry, that it's okay if it's not perfect. It's fine if it's good enough. Um, because perfection is really the enemy of progress. And as you go on, your product will probably get better because you sent it out and you may have the best formulation possible, not because you did it on your own, but because you got the customer feedback early on in your journey. Um, so I think, you know, everyone who's hesitating to try something out, it's okay to just try it out a little bit before trying to be, you know, perfect. And I don't think you can make something that's, I mean, if you're trying to make something that's perfectly sustainable, like 100%, it is, it is not really possible in today's environment with the way the world is set up, with the way industry is set up, where even even um, natural products are made synthetically, you know. Um, right. So you have to, you have to, you have to take the, the best possible path for you. And um, I think you can make a difference anyways. Okay. Uh, yeah, very, very, very good advice. Um, as that was uh, specifically asked by Irena uh, in, in her question, did you do some extensive, I don't know, market research before you started creating your business about the competit uh, competitors? And then, so how, how does that, how did you balance that with your, let's say, sustainability um, ambitions? Um. So when I started it in 2000, when I started the, the process in 2017, sustainability wasn't the buzzword that it is today. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so my market research was actually quite disappointing. <laughs> okay. Um, 
and uh, like I said, I just had to try it out a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of times you try and do the whole big thing in one shot, but by trying it out, we found that it wasn't really market research. But with people using the product, they were happy, and uh, and then they they got happy that the product works and they're making a difference and they've not had to change their lives at all. So it wasn't so much about it was disappointing my market research. I'm sorry, mm. <laughs> I don't have any. Okay, but you still you still did it. It's, yeah, yeah, I thought it's it was worth, <laughs> worth a shot. Okay. Yeah. Karen, anything you would like to share? Yeah, I mean, uh, we also did some market research and as Sean clearly mentioned that the buzzword was still not catching up in 2015 when I started it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, we just went ahead with the product and launched it. Our first response was not very good, but we learned it from that. So, it's more of a trial and error and you try and try until you reach that point. And I'm still trying to make it better. Mm -hmm. So, that is the case. Are there any advices from your side for, for new, let's say, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs? I would say have patience because things don't happen overnight. Have patience to make it happen. Right. Very good. Robert, you as the multi-entrepreneur here. <laughs> uh, you're still on mute. Sorry. Yeah. I think in Karan's case, it's very clear that, of course, you know, he's marketing the colors, but then he's going into the perfumery or the, right. you know, the, that's, that's a fantastic direction. You know, there's a lot of demand in that direction also, taking the flowers, different types of flowers and different composition of flowers and, and get into the essential oils that you, you touched upon that. So I think so that's a good example that you started with something and then you can branch out and branch out in a way that you're not damaging the system. You're not damaging the social echo of the, you know, system, which is also very good. So you're branching out in a kind of a healthy manner, which is, I think, I see is a very, in a positive spirit. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I guess we are very happy to have two really prime examples uh, working on sustainability and, and, and prime examples on the two objectives we've uh, covered today. That was really great. Uh, Colin, anything on your side you want to add or we would like to ask? I think we are heading for the last, last questions or the last minutes. Not too much. Um, I would just say that there is a lot of information. There's a lot of networks and, and tools out there that want entrepreneurs like this to succeed and, and to, to look for those, those networks and to ask questions and ask questions of bigger companies or companies that have had success. I think that will be very helpful. That's something that can be very helpful, of course. I'm not the one who started the company, but that would be my advice. Well, one of our intentions here of this uh, this webinar series is also to hopefully be a, a bit inspiring for, for other entrepreneurs. So uh, perhaps quick and spontaneous question into the audience. Uh, you could uh, perhaps raise your hands. Are there any entrepreneurs around or people uh people considering to be an entrepreneur in the future okay yeah three great okay so a couple i would say yeah cool mm -hmm. Good. Uh, it's uh, it's um, one o'clock in Europe. It's uh, four thirty already in India, and that's the end of our our session. I would like to thank the uh, panelists and, of course, the speakers of today. Thank you very much for sharing your views with us and to to, to present this very these two very exciting. Uh, entrepreneurship examples that was really inspiring um 
I think we learned a lot and it's it's a good start in the to the webinar series the two um, on, on looking at two objectives um, I think you were also perfect examples of combining really uh, social uh, benefits and uh, uh, and environmental uh, benefits in your uh, business and having a very holistic view on on things so that that's uh, really that makes me very optimistic um, I would like to conclude uh, with, uh, um, let's say, an announcement for the next webinar. We will have a next webinar that's scheduled for 15th of September. Um, so please stay tuned with us. Uh, we will announce again the program and we will inform you about the details as uh, soon as possible. And then it will be in a similar setting uh, about two other of the um, objectives. So that's the next uh, webinar uh, coming up. Uh, and with this, I also like to thank uh, Colin and um, uh, and also um, uh, Vikram um, as our partner uh, of this whole endeavor of the Sustainable Chemistry Club. And uh, I hope it was interesting for you as an audience. Um, as I said, stay tuned, uh, be back with us uh, for the next session and have a very good rest of the day or even start of the day if you are uh, from the US like uh, Colin. <laughs> Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Alexis. Thank you.